Uh, good morning to you who have become the body of Christ in this place and time. I said it before, said it last year for those of you who were here. You could have chosen to be anywhere, and you chose to be here. And I give God thanks for that. For all of what will unfold, for all of what you have brought with you, for all of what you will take with you on this day of celebration and new life and resurrection, thanks be to God for every single one of you. Having said that, I invite you to open your souls, open your minds, open your hearts as our choir brings us more deeply yet into this celebration and worship. Listen with the fullness of your life. Everybody awake now? Good. Then for all of you who are able, and if it is comfortable for you, please stand with me that we might share the call to worship that is found in our bulletin. And please note ahead of time, some of you will be called on specially to read. The men, the women, the children. I'm going to let you decide how you determine that for yourself. From the beginning, the early church proclaimed, Christ is risen. Throughout all of time, the church has proclaimed, Christ is risen. Faithful men throughout the ages have proclaimed, Faithful women throughout the ages have proclaimed, Children too have proclaimed. Each and all, great and small, Unite our voices to proclaim, Christ is risen, he is risen in truth. Alleluia.
sit down. You got more work to do. Thank you up there. The unison invocation. With our voices every bit as clear as what you just participated in, let us say, one heart, one soul, one voice. Creator God, original source of all living things, we offer our songs of praise to you this day for the recreating power of life in evidence all around us. We offer our praise to you for the timely and timeless resurrection of Jesus our Christ. Help each and all of us to sense your presence amongst us this morning. Inspire us to co-create with you a renewed and renewing reality where love is always stronger than fear and life is always victorious over death. In ways beyond our knowing, Roll back the stones of our hearts that we may live lovingly in your light this day and always. Amen. Now, you've earned it. Please be seated.
was good. And now that you're here, I have a familiar story to tell. <laughs> For one last time. But you know the story, right? I mean, you really do know the story that Jesus went into Jerusalem and Jesus was not all that well received by the religious authorities. And they were thinking, they were hoping that Jesus would be a little bit like that, a flash and then gone. But you know what? He wasn't, and that's why we celebrate Easter. Because although they thought he was a flash and then gone, what in fact happened was they tried to extinguish his light, and then they tried again to extinguish his light, and then they tried yet again by nailing him to a cross and killing him and extinguishing his light. But it didn't work. It never has worked. There is a poverty in that kind of violence. There is an unwinnable fact that love always prevails. It may not look it. It may be the times in our lives when we think the flame of love has been blown out. But it will not, cannot, should not, and will not ever. Oh, you of little faith. Once, just once, once, in all of the years of doing this, Ryan Charette, four-year-old at the time, blew it out with such saliva. <laughs> but with that exception, the light of love prevails all the time. And that's what brings us here today. That's how you can change the world with your love and the love of God deeply inside of you. Thanks be to God for all of you, each of you. And you can go back to your families at this time. deeply lady. Good morning and happy Easter. My name is Lou Cashmar and I will be reading from the New Testament John verses chapter 20 verses 1 through 18, which can be found in the New Testament in the Pew Bible, if you wish to follow along, pages 100 and 101. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Then, Peter and the other disciples set out, set out and went towards the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. 
he saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head not lying with the linen wrappings but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in and he saw it and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood there weeping outside the womb, the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me, where have you laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the, to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he has said these things to her. May you continue to have a blessed and holy week. are so many things that happen in the course of a gathering like this and each one of them touched me and I, I, I can't help myself sometimes to take note. So for those of you who have young ones in your arms or in a bassinet next to you, when they are singing out in harmony that I just heard, let them sing because I would much rather have singing babies than snoring saints. <laughs> and there's only two people in this world that are concerned about their singing baby, and that's the dad and the mom. And the rest of us are just fine. Your child, your children are welcome. Dr. Paul Stuckey tells a story of an eye-catching ad in the Milwaukee, Wisconsin newspaper classified section. It read, big bold letters advertised, used tombstones. <laughs> the ad's text read as follows. You can't make this stuff up. <laughs> used tombstone for sale, real bargain to someone named Dingo. <laughs> for more information, call. <laughs> the image of a used tombstone 
may at first seem uh, comical or maudlin and maybe even a little depressing, but think about it a little bit differently. A used tombstone means that its previous owner no longer has any need of it. It's become a cast off and unnecessary item. The Easter tidings of resurrection in all of its multiple layers, however we begin to try to take that mystery in and make it ours, is the same message. The tomb is empty. Death does not prevail. The stone marker is no longer needed. I have seen the Lord. Christians, however, in order to qualify as the owner of a used tombstone, must catch on some of that excitement of the resurrection faith in our day, in our age, at this time, in this place. And that's not necessarily an easy thing to do. In our scripture for today that Luz just shared with us, Peter and the beloved disciple caught on pretty quickly when, after viewing the abandoned tomb, they believed not in human grave robbers, but in God's most astonishing grave robbing activity in all of human history. Conversely, Mary, her heart broken, confronted with the same evidence, could only perceive a lost opportunity to mourn at the feet of her teacher. Her spirit was entombed. So all of the scripture that we've been going through this week, all of the scripture shows the early church's attempt to teach, to correctly grasp the hand, the essence, the power of resurrection faith. Paul and Peter and John in our scripture and Mary all struggled to bring the sense of the resurrected life and faith into their experience. For each of them, there came a critical moment when they faced the crushing and depressing power of the cross, the instrument of capital punishment of the time. And then, then they saw through it. They saw beyond it. They got the point. They got to the point of being able to proclaim, I have seen the Lord. Jack Young, a pastor, a Unitarian Universalist pastor in Tennessee, uses the phrase Eastering event to describe those crucibles, those moments, those containers, those times in our lives which emerge a resurrection faith. Eastering events succeed in transforming the crucifixion from a stumbling block into a stepping stone. Paul's Eastering event occurred on that Damascus road where despite his former animosity to the church, he experienced the risen Christ in such brilliant fashion that his eyes and his soul were sun blinded for days. And the other disciple, we don't know who that is, always known as the other disciple, who ran faster than Peter, described in today's scripture, experienced an Eastering when he saw the shrouded, littered interior of the empty tomb. And rather than succumbing to fear and confusion, he believed. Jesus spoke her name and opened her spirit. Right? Mary. Oh, Rabboni. Peter after witnessing the empty tomb and later actually talking and eating with the resurrected Jesus, no doubt assumed he had celebrated all his personal Easterings, but part of the living resurrection faith, part of what you and I probably know, but I'm here to remind you, is that that is never a one and done. Respectful of March Madness, it's never one and done. The Eastering events keep coming at us as our souls are open to that possibility. It's an ongoing, continual realization. Those Eastering events can be as particular as we are peculiar. That is to say, they can be highly individualized, no two the same. However, what they typically share is when those things happen, 
in the way that they come to us individually and peculiarly, the response is always, oh, I have seen the Lord. And how the resurrected Lord appears to any of us at any time is the tricky part. Almost 40 years ago, I preached my first Easter sermon. It was a story, a res resurrection story, an Eastering story. Is that story true? Someone asked me. I didn't know then and I don't know now, but what I do know now is that there is truth in the story. So let me tell it one last time. I saw a strange sight. I stumbled upon a story most strange, like nothing my life, my street sense, my years and years of education had ever prepared me for. Hush now, and I will tell you the story of the ragman. Even before the dawn on Friday morning, I noticed a young man, handsome and strong, walking the alleys of our city. He was pulling an old cart filled with clothes bright and new. And he was calling in a clear tenor voice, rags. The air was foul and the first light filthy to be caressed by such a sweet music. Rags, new rags for old. I take your tired rags, rags. Now, this is a wonder, I thought to myself, for a man stood well over six feet tall, and his arms were like tree limbs, hard and muscular, and his eyes flashed in intelligence. Could he find no better job than this, to be a rag man in the city? I followed him. My curiosity drove me, and I was not disappointed. Soon the ragman saw a woman sitting on her back porch. She was sobbing into a handkerchief, sighing and shedding a thousand tears. Her knees and her elbows made a sad X. Her shoulders shook. Her heart was breaking. The ragman stopped his cart. Quietly, he walked to the woman, stepping around tin cans, dead toys, and pampers. Give me your rag, he said so gently, and I will give you another. He slipped the handkerchief from her eyes. She looked up, and he laid across her palm a linen cloth so clean, so new, that it shined. She blinked from the gift to the giver. Then, as he began to pull his cart again, the ragman did a strange thing. He put her stained handkerchief to his own face, and he began to weep. He began to sob so grievously as she had done, his shoulders shaking, yet she was left without a tear. This is a wonder, I breathed to myself, and I followed the sobbing ragman like a child who cannot turn away from a mystery. Rags, rags, new rags for old. In a little while, when the sky showed gray beyond the rooftops, and I could see the shredded curtains hanging out of black windows, the ragman came upon a girl whose head was wrapped in a bandage, whose eyes were empty. Blood soaked her bandage. A single line of blood ran down her cheek. Now the tall ragman looked upon the child with pity, and he drew a lovely yellow bonnet from his cart. Give me your rag, he said, 
tracing his own line on her cheek, and I'll give you mine. The child could only gaze at him a while. He loosened the bandage, removed it, tied it on to his own head, and I gasped at what I saw. For with the bandage went the wound. Against his brow it ran a darker, more substantial blood, his own. Rags, rags, new rags for old, cried the sobbing, bleeding, strong, intelligent ragman. The rising sun hurt both the sky now and my eyes. The ragman seemed more and more in a hurry. Are you going to work? He asked a man who leaned against a telephone pole. The man shook his head. The ragman pressed him, do you have a job? Are you crazy? Sneered the other. He pulled away from the pole, revealing the right sleeve of his jacket, flat, the cuff stuffed into a pocket. He had no arm. So, said the ragman, give me your jacket and I'll give you mine. Such quiet authority in his voice, the one-armed man took off his jacket. So did the ragman, and I trembled at what I saw. For the ragman's arm stayed in its sleeve, and when the other put on it, he had two good arms, thick as tree limbs, but the ragman had only one. Go to work, he said. After that, the ragman found a drunk, lying unconscious beneath an army blanket, an old man, hunched, wizened, and sick. He took the blanket and he wrapped it around himself, but for the drunk, he left new clothes. Now, now I had to run quickly to keep up with the ragman. Though he was weeping uncontrollably, bleeding freely at the forehead, pulling his cart with one arm, stumbling for his drunkenness, falling again and again, exhausted, old, old and sick, yet he went at a terrible speed. On spider legs he skittered through the streets and alleys of the city, this mile and the next, until he came to its limits. And then he rushed beyond. I wept to see the change in this man. I hurt to see his sorrow. And yet I needed to see where he was going in such haste, perhaps to know what drove him so. The little old ragman came to a landfill. He came to the garbage dump. I wanted to help him in what he did, but I hung back, hiding. He climbed the hill. With tormented labor, he cleared a little space on that stinking hill. And then he sighed. He laid down. He pillowed his head on a handkerchief and a jacket. He covered his bones with an army blanket. And he died. How I cried to witness that death. I slumped in a junked car and I wailed and mourned as one who had no hope because I had come to love the ragman. Every other face had faded in the wonder of this man and I cherished him, but he died and I cried myself to sleep. I did not know, how could I know, that I slept through Friday night and Saturday and its night too. But then, on Sunday morning, I was wakened by a bright violence, light, pure, hard, demanding light slammed against my sour face and I blinked and I looked and I saw the last and the first wonder of it all there 
was the ragman, folding the blanket most carefully, a scar on his forehead, but alive, and besides that, healthy, there was no sign of sorrow nor of age, and all the rags that he had gathered shined for cleanliness. Well, then I lowered my head, and trembling for all that I had seen, I myself walked up to the ragman. I told him my name with shame, for I was a sorry figure next to him. Then I took off my clothes in that place, and I said to him with dear yearning in my voice, dress me. He dressed me. Oh, my Lord, he put new rags on me, and I, a wonder beside him, the ragman, the ragman, the ragman, I have seen the Lord. So today, I pray for you, an Eastering event, an Eastering event that will give you courage, that will give you hope, that will stop your bleeding and make you whole again. And perhaps, just perhaps, we too might be a ragman for others, that they may say, I have seen the Lord. Friends, please be seated.
The tradition in our community here at First Parish is to share the prayer time with prayers that come from the people. But on this day, we shall hold the prayers that are close to our hearts. We shall indeed join our hearts in a prayer. And so for this time, on this day, I invite your hearts to be deepened and connected as the choir brings us into our time of prayer. Most gracious, most glorious God, majestic and merciful God, giver of the very breath of life and conqueror of the shadow of death, mover of stone and rock of my soul, creator of heaven and earth and all that lay between, thank you. Thank you for your open embrace of the prayers of your people gathered here. We who are simply the most recent incarnation in a long line of saints and sinners, who in wisdom and hope and sometimes in desperation have sought and sought and sought you, only to be surprised by how close you have always been. Thank you, O oh God for enabling our prayers of thanksgiving for the bountiful blessings bestowed for the way we have been loved way beyond our earning and even beyond our deserving, but never beyond our yearning. For the multitude of mercies showering our souls so that we might blossom like the lilies of this day. For the soils of secret kindness which nurture, surround, and sustain us. For all that we can name and all that is beneath, beside, and beyond our naming, thank you. We thank you too, O oh God, as we remember today those who have brought us to this moment for the very gift of life from our parents and the love of our grandparents and their parents before them whose light of faith still flickers in our souls, for the tender and funny and wise witness of our children, and also for all those, O oh God, who can only be with us this day through the realm of our remembering and the power of prayer. For their ongoing witness in our lives, we offer our thanks. And so on this Easter day, help us to hear again and again your promise of life everlasting. Help us to feel richly refreshed and renewed in its power. For this your church and for these your people, each with their unique story, everyone precious in your sight, all with both deep needs and significant glories, we offer our prayers and seek this day and all days the ongoing sense of your spirit in our midst. We pray as well for those persons beyond these walls, for those whose home is wherever they find shelter tonight. Hear our prayers. For those for whom the burdens of oppressive poverty weigh heavily on their hearts, hear our prayers. For those who have lost the gift of freedom to the chains of addictions, hear our prayers. For those for whom the increasing years have brought the increase of uncertainty amid the decrease of resources, hear our prayers. 
for those whose road on their journey toward wholeness is currently potholed, painful, and problematic, hear our prayers. For their families who love them and for the compassionate ones who provide care for them, hear our prayers. And for those, O oh God, for whom violence is both domestic and imported, for those sisters and brothers at great risk nearby and at some distance in Sacco and Syria, in Biddeford and Brussels, in Kennebunk and Cabal, in Scarborough and South Korea, in Old Orchard and New York, God, hear our prayers. For those sisters and brothers who are closeted by rightful fear and those that are closed off by their bigotry, those whose today are at risk from beatings, bombings, bullyings, and belligerences, hear our prayers. And for those, O oh most gracious God, who literally have no one to pray for them, hear our prayers. Gracious and merciful God, Enable us to be instruments of your peace. Use us to help you craft the realm that your risen Son came to name and proclaim, for it is in the name of Jesus, the risen one, amongst the floral beauty and the faithful bequests of this fellowship that we pray in his words by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It is such a privilege to be able to share our abundance. It is such a joy to participate in an offering. And as many of my colleagues would say, it wouldn't be church if we didn't take an offering. But this is church. This is the people gathered in the presence of God and in the joy of the faith. I invite you to participate not only in giving, but in receiving the offering of the choir, let us do so with the joy of the faith.
O oh, most glorious and gracious God, thank you for this day, for this music, for these offerings, in these plates and in these pews. Magnify them, multiply them by the power of your love, that they may speak in languages we have never known, accomplish tasks we have never been trained for, go places we cannot travel, all in the name of your risen Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. gracious unto you. And as you go forth from this place, this Easter Sunday, out into your world, be ambassadors of the good news. Know that you are powerfully, deeply loved by God. Share that good news with others in a world so desperate for good news. Go forth in power. Go forth in peace.